So good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight for this uh, promising discussion on the, this quite unprecedented uh, event that happened a few weeks ago, this uh, referendum in Switzerland on Volgeld, or in French we say money plan, or in English sovereign money or full money, depending on your uh, preference. Um, my name is Stanislav Jordan. I'm uh, leading uh, Posimony Europe. Uh, we are, uh, Posimony is a non-profit organization founded in 2010 in the UK. Um, and our mission is to advocate for uh, an, a monetary system that helps um, uh, a fair, democratic, and sustainable monet uh, economy. And um, it's only recent that we are uh, in Brussels. I joined Pussy Money in 2015 in order to develop uh, our campaigns in, in the EU and, and specifically the Eurozone. Um, and so we just launched earlier this, this year, and last month we had a uh, a big event um, with prominent speakers. Um, and basically our aim here uh, is to do campaigns, uh, advocacy, trying to improve, challenge, question the policies of the, of the European uh, Central Bank specifically. But tonight we're not talking about the ECB so much. Tonight we're talking about Switzerland, as I said. Um, indeed, it's not so often that people have a voice on monetary policy. Uh, except perhaps in Switzerland where you have direct democracy and you can, citizens who gather in a, enough signatures can trigger a, a nationwide referendum. And this is what happened. It's not the first time there's a referendum in Switzerland about money. I think in 2014 there was a referendum on, on gold, on the, the reserves. The reserves of the Swiss National Bank, the proposal was to force central, the, the SNB, the Swiss National Bank, to have at least 20%, I think of their reserves relative to the size of their uh, balance sheet. I mean, it's not really the topic for tonight, but just to say it's, it's thanks to this direct democracy um, uh, system that we can have those discussions. Um, and more recently, there was this initiative on Volgeld. Um, and maybe I will say just a few words uh, about what, what Volgeld is really, so that we are on the same page before we can go more in the practical discussion. So essentially, Volgeld or full money uh, does three things, three main changes in the in the system. So, first, it would remove the ability of commercial banks to create money when they extend credit. Um, so, in case you don't know, so it's now a well-established fact that the banking sector on aggregate creates money when 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 they they, lo they lend money to the economy through the sometimes called fractional reserve banking system. And so, with the Vogel system banks cannot just create credit. They have to secure, they have to make sure that they have loanable funds. That means they cannot just use deposits for that. They have to make sure that the money is, uh, is for example, the time deposit. Um, so if banks cannot create money in this way, what this means is that the central bank will have the monopoly of, uh, of, uh, of the money supply. Um, and there are many ways that central bank can in inject money in the circulation. One, I think this is a proposal of the Swiss, which is that the money would go to uh, the state and the cantons. Uh, another proposal is that it could go straight to everyone as a, as, a, as a citizen's dividend. So imagine you could get a small amount of money every year in your bank account. Uh, but they could also use pretty much the same way they are doing today by providing funds to the banks, and those funds could be lent to in the economy. That's another way. Um, but the point is that the central bank is making the decision on how much money should be injected in the system. Ultimately, the, the, what this means as well is that uh, deposits, so our money in, in those banks, in our banks, um, becomes entirely safe, um, even if the bank goes bankrupt, uh, which is probably the, 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 the main benefit, perhaps. Um, and this is because at the technical level, if we do a Volgeld system, a sovereign money system, the, the deposits would be converted into central bank money, which is the purest form of money in a way. This, it's completely uh, uh, legal tender. Um, so another way to look at it is to think of deposits or, or money in the bank would become off balance sheet. They are separated from, uh, f from what the bank uh, owes to, to, to other people. It's not a debt. Um, 
And that means as well, and this is perhaps the, 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 the key argument that some prominent figures have been making, for example, Martin Wolf, uh, the chief commentators of, these, of the Financial Times, or the former governor of the Bank of Spain, which we had at our event last month, um, they say, uh, well, quote, Martin Wolf says, with, with money unambiguously safe, it would be far easier to let risk-taking institutions, meaning the banks, bear the full consequences of their failures. So essentially he's saying, with this system, we could let the banks fail. It wouldn't be a, a danger for people's money. And that means we could have a truly free market for banks. Uh, we could have more competition between the banks because we don't need uh, the, 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 the deposit guarantee, uh, which is the, perhaps the biggest subsidy to the, to the banking sector. I guess we can talk more about that later. Um, so this, this is sort of a new idea for the media, but in fact it's, a long, it's been a long, uh, long uh, it's an old idea. Uh, at Posimony, since 2010, we've been uh, championing this proposal in the UK. Um, and we've, yeah, we've done quite a bit of research, promotion. I mean, I, wasn't, I haven't been the one doing this work, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's a big, uh, we've been pioneering this idea now. That said, I mean, today we are pretty well aware that all the objections, all the, all the questions, all the, all the problems with this proposal have not been entirely solved. And this is why we're here today as well, to keep the discussion going and to keep debating on this. And of course, the second reason we wanted to do this event is uh, because it's not, every, you know, it's not every day that we have such a unique experience of having a country where the whole population is asked to vote on this. Um, so it's a unique experience, we want to learn from it. Uh, we are keen to know how was the campaign organized, how, how did people receive this idea, how did the political system um, react, uh, the role of the central bank as well in the debate. That's really the, the, the thing we are really curious to know more about. Um, and basically what lessons can we, can we draw from it uh, if we were to support this in the Eurozone, for example. So to discuss this issues, I'm really pleased to have two or two guests here uh, who both come from directly from Switzerland. In fact, we are quite lucky to have you because uh, there was a flight delay from Geneva, so we almost uh, lost the two of you uh, because you were on the same plane, so <laughs> it could have been a disaster, but we, we are all lucky to have you here. Um, so on my right, Mauricio J. Giacomi, D. Giacomi, sorry, That's who uh, you are the spokesperson, one of the spokespersons of the campaign. And uh, you've been working on this for what, three years, four years? Since 2014, June 2014. So four years, four years. yeah. Uh, so you will present us the campaign, how it went from the ground. Um, and uh, Michael Malcarty, <coughs> fund manager at Quero Capital which is an investment firm based in Geneva. And, um, and yes, and I, I will moderate uh, the, the, the discussion. Um, so we'll try to stick with um, one hour, and afterwards you are more than welcome to join us for some drinks. And uh, that's it, let's kick off. Mauricio, if you want to have the floor. Thanks, Dan, for inviting me. Hello, everyone. And uh, thanks for being here today and listen to what we are have to talk about uh, the Folgeld Initiative, which uh, really was uh, an absolutely fascinating experience, I have to say, for me. Um, I, I come for originally from, from the field of marketing and communication, and when I joined the campaign, um, I, was, I, was, I thought it was it's absolutely challenging to, uh, to communicate the issue of, uh, of monetary reform to people um, that usually are not really um, focusing on the details how the monetary system works and um, and uh, that's um, that's one of the main reasons why why I um, why I joined the other reason obviously was as well that I thought that uh, our monetary system how it works today is uh, is flawed it's um, it's not really working in the way it should it produces um, large side effects, you know, when, when, it, uh, when it creates money and allocates uh, money or credit, then, um, then, then it's, it, it doesn't go where it should go in order to, um, to help civilization to prosper. So uh, I thought it's um, a very good and important um, thing to do to, you know, um, start starting a debate, you know, and um, 
maybe uh, this is what what uh, the main purpose of a, of a, of a people's initiative, as we call it in Switzerland, is, you know, you, you um, bring an issue onto the political agenda and um, in, in, into consciousness of, of society by, um, by using this uh, direct democratic uh, instrument, and we are very lucky to have it. And um, I guess most of the people that uh, started with the initiative, they already knew that it's going to be incredibly difficult to win this referendum because statistically only one in ten referendums actually really pass because uh, I guess Switzerland is a, is a country where everyone actually lives a very good life, you know, and if you say no to a proposal, it's always, always to say yes to the status quo. So every one of us was already aware that it's going to be incredibly difficult to really win and then Im implement a reform. But we, we figured that it's, abs we, we thought that it's absolutely worth it to, um, to make the effort to, to uh, in order to bring this topic um, on the political ag agenda and, um, and into the media and to, to, to start a debate and, uh, and a discussion. And um, well, you know, if you, if you do a referendum, then as we heard before from, from Stan, then, uh, then uh, all, Swiss, all Swiss citizens vote on it, so you can be sure that uh, in the end everyone is, uh, is thinking about, um, about uh, the issue. But it's, uh, it's also challenging to, to, um, to reach that point, because uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Swiss uh, democracy and uh, the Swiss People's Initiative with this instrument. I will shortly um, speak about it. The good thing is you can, every Swiss citizen can start a people's initiative. You know, you can sit down with your body and think, you know, this is an important topic that needs to be discussed and um, the politicians didn't, didn't uh, think uh, about it and didn't talk about it. So, so we want to use these instruments to, to make it happen. And it's like you can compare it to a, to a direct democratic gas pedal. You, know, you, give, some, you give some speed on an issue. And um, then, then you have to, what you do is you write a text and this text is a, a proposed change to the constitution. So what you, what you do with this initiative, this is the ultimate goal, is if you win, you change the constitution. And, um, and in order to do that, you prepare a proposed change to the constitution, to the article you want to change. In Switzerland, the uh, moni monet monetary regulation is article 99 and so on. And um, so we designed this text and then we started collecting signatures. And um, you need 100,000 signatures in order, valid signatures in order to, um, to get to a vote. And um, you have 18 months time. And, uh, and I st when I joined the campaign, we just, we just started the, the collecting of signatures. And, and already there, most of, um, of the people in the establishment, from the banking sector, from the politicians, from the parties, from the economic associations, they said, you know, you have no chance to collect these signatures because what you're proposing here, actually no one, no one really understands and no one, no one even thinks about in his all day life about how money is being created and why this should be, why it is important to, to uh, think about um, the impact of, of money creation and um, how it could be changed. And there was another, another problem for us um, why everyone thought we wouldn't succeed is, is because people had this idea um, that a bank takes uh, the safest money, you know, and then lends it on to the guy who wants to build a house. And this fixed idea was promoted by banks and, and also in schools. Um, I, studied, uh, I, I studied at the business school in St. Gallen and um, in our textbooks we had, this, uh, we had this idea and role of the banks and, and I, th I think, um, I think this, is, this is, uh, very problematic, you know, if you don't describe how the system works properly even to, to economic students, but this, this is something we maybe can discuss later. Anyhow, if you go on the streets and, to, to, and explain to someone how the banking system works today and that the idea the people have in their mind is completely uh, wrong, then 
then usually they they um, react with a little bit, you know, um, they with resistance. They think, you know, this is what we learned, and uh, I went to school, and this professor told me that, and you know, uh, who are you <laughs> actually to tell me that that well, all I know or I thought was right is wrong? And um, but still, we we kind of um, were uh, very uh, motivated and had a good crew, and uh, we spent a lot of time on the streets. Um, and and uh, we kind of managed within uh, these 18 months to collect the the necessary <coughs> amount of signatures, valid signatures, and um, and uh, we we then uh, got uh, we we knew we c we 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 got to a vote, and the what what then started like the the second phase of of our of our campaign you know when you know yes the vote will come then um, you have um, you have to kind of plan the problem is you you don't know when exactly the voting date will be because um, the first the, the the small chamber of the parliament discusses the the proposal then the the big chamber of the uh, parliament discusses the proposal and um, sometimes uh, they they suggest you know an alternative and then it goes back and forward until they they um, they they made up their minds and then they recommend what Swiss people should vote and in in our case um, they were completely against the proposal but it's absolutely unnecessary it's risky it's dangerous it's um, it's the wrong way to uh, to uh, the idea behind it is good. We want to make the the, the financial system more stable. It's what they say, but it's the wrong um, the wrong solution. So so they the, the basically all the parties and uh, all um, politicians recommended not to support uh, the proposal, and um, this made um, yeah. What about the work? the worker unions as well it it really so we, we the, the whole i would say est establishment from from left to right including the workers union were opposing um the proposal and also the all the um, all the associations like the um like the economic economic associations um there are a variety from from each uh, field um, they, they were all just copying um, the, the suggestions of the banking association. They said, you know, it's dangerous, risky, and it will, in the end, um, be negative for the, um, for the com competitiveness of, of Switzerland, and, uh, and uh, in the end, um, everyone will suffer. So um, we knew we had this huge front against us, and um, that's because the neither the small nor the big chamber suggested an alternative proposal um, we, we knew that the vote will be coming quite uh, soon so we try what we tried is to to um, to raise some funds and find some supporters you know we, we try to to uh, at least uh, grow our our supporter base um, you know, we had a lot of people that supported us, um, just you know, collecting the signatures, and they had the network. So, so we knew our only um, our only chance is uh, to to uh, motivate uh, all the the people that were already supporting us from the beginning to convince maybe their friends and their family uh, to support us too and grow the base and and uh, and 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 also donate. So, so the whole campaign in the end was financed by. Uh, by the people uh, that yes that that figure that found that that this uh, initiative is is um, a value a value a valuable thing and um, yes this obviously if you have to if if you have such uh, a huge front against you then uh, then it's like a fight uh, David against uh, Goliath anyway um, we we. Can I just ask you, like, because at in the last week, though, there was quite big media attention in, in foreign media. For example, the Financial Times, I was mentioning Martin Wolf came out, say, the Swiss, I hope, you said literally, I, I hope the Swiss vote yes. Yes. Uh, the Economist made it quite good as well. I mean, perhaps not fully sportive, but quite a good article. So you, you had still, like, prominent economic media supporting at least, this did that help? 
just just right before the for the refer before the referendum. So what what w what we did is we just try to make the maximum out of um, what um, what our resources uh, were. And the good thing is, you know, the date came. It was set. And right before before the date, the international media usually is very interested in what happens in Switzerland. You know, it it is um, it is like a, a, a playing field for uh, new and interesting ideas. It's uh, it's you know it, it it is a place where you can also with the basic income. It was the same thing. You know, it, uh, a small group decided to to um, promote the basic income by using the instrument of uh, of, uh, of the People's Initiative, and it worked. It worked very well. It, w it, it uh, the the international media. Um, covered uh, the um, the proposal um, very broadly, and it was the same thing with uh, with our with our idea to end fractional reserve banking and to separate money and credit and to start you know um, um, paying uh, d dividends directly to to citizens. Um, all these all these ideas were uh, were very re re revolutionary in the eyes of the international media and um, for us I mean it was from the from the one side we were proud that we reached such a big audience but on the other hand it was also you know it was it was also um, a bit um, ambiguous because our proponents said what you suggest is an experiment and you want to experiment with our high standard of living you know you, you, we have everything, and now why would you why would you want to make such a radical change and risk of losing what we have? And then the international media go like, "Yeah, you should do this experiment, you know. <laughs> Come on, guys, you, you really, you definitely should." And then the comments, the comments um, from from the people who read these articles, they were, "Yeah, well, if I would sit in England, you know, if I was Martin Wolf, I would love to to see uh, Switzerland." Um, you know, ma making this, uh, having this ex experiment, and then if it goes right, yeah, I can follow, and if it, uh, it goes wrong, then well, I'm, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine, and um, and uh, this is, you know, it, 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 in the coverage internationally, f I pers I personally fo found we we did a very good job with the resources we had. We reached out and we. Yes. Yeah. C can you explain exactly your, your proposal? Because as I saw it, for me it was exactly what we implemented in Argentina in the 70s. Yeah. At the time of Perón, we had also a system where the credits were, were managed by the central bank. Yeah. Okay, the deposit were accepted by the commercial banks in name of the central bank. Yeah. And in principle, as I saw your proposal, as I heard your proposal in the radio in, in Switzerland, was was that system for me was not so innovative idea. I saw it as a, an idea that we already had it in Argentina many years ago and didn't work. Yeah, um, I, I don't know about uh, about uh, Argentinian case. I'm very curious to learn more about it. Um, the proposal. Is really to um, take all the deposits out from from the bank's balance sheet and separate it. We want the proposal is to have a payment system separated from from bank's balance sheets. You know, and then if you do a payment, you use central bank digital currency. Yeah, and currency is only issued by the central bank, and banks actually don't exist any longer. If you if you Want to want to be honest because you you change the bank into a mutual fund. You know what the, if a bank wants to lend money, then it just it cannot create credit anymore because credit and money is separated. Um, a bank then would need to go to the customer and ask for money. It would have to it would have to go to you and ask you for for deposits, and then you deposit your savings in the bank, and then the bank can lend on what you what you provided to the bank. you open the possibilities for commercial bank in your, in your proposition to uh, take money, uh, rent money from the central bank Absolutely. and then give it back, uh, rent it back uh, to the people, I mean to the, the, the world. Yes. Yes. With the house or stuff like that. Yes. <laughs> the, 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 the that was open because the, the main uh, critics 
once all the central bank cannot know where the money will go. Can I just excuse, but I, I, I suggest we keep those burning questions uh, for the debate later. I propose you wrap up with like kind of your, okay, so the results was 25% in the end in yes. support. Is that, is that a result for you that you, you know, if you look back two years before when you were collecting the synergy in the street, do you, did you imagine you would get more or less? How do you judge that, that percentage? And also the, the low turnout, the low participation rate, 33% people actually voted. So how do you evaluate that? And then we'll move to... As the, I, I would say, wh you know, when, I s when I started um, promoting Folgeld, actually the, the result wasn't um, a main focus. Important was to, you know, get to a vote and inform, inform the people. It was, mm. it, was, it was about educating the people about how money works and how the monetary system works and that money and credit today is, uh, is the same, yeah, and that all the time you, you pay, you use actually um, private, privately created bank credit. Yeah. This, is, this is what's very important to make the people understand how this, how this, uh, how this system works. And, um, and I guess we, 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 we only succeeded half, you know, because the problem was we, the biggest opponent we had in the end, because uh, the banks, they, they actually didn't campaign at all, but what they did is they, um, they sent um, Thomas Jordan, who is, the, who is the director of the Swiss Nas National Bank, they, he was the front runner of the, of the campaign against Folgel. And the Swiss National Bank is really is a, an institution with, with a very good reputu reputation, you know. Swiss people, they trust the Swiss National Bank, you know. And then when Thomas Jordan uh, says that this, this, what we do is, is just unnecessary, it's dangerous, it's, it's ruining the economy, and he went even further. He, sa he said that what we say is not correct, that, that, you know, then he goes and holds presentations and says, you know, uh, that um, ba banks use um, the deposits to give credit, you know, to lend. Then for the people were like they were confused. They were saying, "Okay, now the Folgeld guys they say this, and the Thomas Jordan says something else," you know, and 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 I guess this was also a reason why the turnout was so low because people just they didn't know what to vote and they didn't know who is right. They were just like they were unsure, and 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 in the end, only 33 percent really um, um, voted, mm. and uh, this is I mean this is a bit disappointing, absolutely. You know, if you because if you have to go to actually educate people, and then only 33% really go to cast a vote because um, because they're confused, then then you kind of didn't succeed. Mm. Yeah, and uh, and um, I think this is um, uh, there was an article in in the Weltwoche. It's a, it's a uh, it's a weekly uh, newspaper. They said that it's a pity that the the campaign and the the um, the people in favor of the of, of Folgeld and people against um, Folgeld have such a low um, debating culture, you know, that you know it is a missed opportunity because it's a very important issue that needs to be discussed. And if you would discuss it um, properly, then it's a chance for everyone to, you know, to reform the system maybe in the future. And because because the there was actually no debating culture. You know, we said something, and the others said that it's not true what we say. Then, then, uh, then you, you just you, you're not getting anywhere. Mm. And um, yeah, but in in the end, you know, I th I think uh, just uh, the fact that uh, uh, where I started, that two bodies can sit together, you know, decide that this is an important issue, and we, we should we should um, you know discuss it and put it on the political agenda and then that you know from from within the society uh, such a, a, a proposal can grow into a people's initiative and then um, whole Switzerland is have voted on it this is uh, for, for me this is uh, this is a success and ups, uh, obviously also the coverage in the international media and that I'm sitting here today and talk um, to <laughs> you and answer your questions great thanks and bravo yeah. Uh, okay, let's turn now to Michael, who will um, do a short presentation. And I forgot to say in the intro that Michael also recently wrote uh, a book about uh, the money system. Uh, it's in French, but and you can get free copies outside as well. It's called For a New Monetary Order. Uh, for a Nouvelle Ordre Monétaire in France. Yes.
Over to you, Michael. Thank you. So my role today would have is to basically bring a bit of a kind of critical view of uh, the uh, referendum, uh, but also to perhaps give some, uh, 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 I would say, some uh, ideas for where we can go next, basically. So just quickly, the result of the vote, 76% uh, of the population refused the vote, 100% of all cantons refused the vote. The maximum yes was in Geneva, where I come from, with 40% uh, of yes. And this, despite the turnout, which was very low, which prior to the vote, people thought if the turnout is low, it's going to favor, actually, the yes side. And I think, I don't know how it was in uh, German-speaking Switzerland, but I think most of the, of the campaigners for the referendum thought that they would get a much higher result and could even win. I mean, the people I talked to. Anyway, so I think uh, uh, um, so that's the result, anyway. So my view is that, actually, it's not a yes to the status quo. Uh, from the discussions I have, from the fact that I think a lot of people think that there is some problem that we need to solve, it was not a yes to the status quo. It was a no to a specific proposal, which probably was too, uh, I think, was too radical. I think it also surfed because it was too abstract and vague. And, uh, and then we can talk about that aspect in particular. And then uh, it was, to some extent, uh, disconnected from the Swiss political realities, actually. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just to, you know, to nurture the debate, to b talk about a few themes which I think are relevant, and then I'm along, as I go along these themes, I'm going to try to also point out as where I think the full guilt uh, people uh, failed, in my opinion. So just first of all, because uh, when we go out of Switzerland, there's a lot of kind of uh, uh, a lot of uh, weird ideas about how uh, direct democracy works and how this referendum works, and uh, and so I'd like to say a few things about that. So some people have a romanticized idea of democracy, and that democracy is basically about a homogeneous people versus a homogeneous elite. And that's the drawing you have here. You know, the people is just totally black or gray here. We don't know really who they are, but it's the people. So if they held that view of, of society and of democracy, as, for example, populist parties uh, do, then you might think, oh, you know, a uh, referendum right is just perfect instrument for the voice of the people to be heard. And at the same time, amongst the establishment, you can find some people who also fear, have that view as well, and they fear then the referendum as being, ooh, if the people have a voice, then you know, we might end up doing something totally stupid. In my opinion, the, you know, democracy is not that. It's just a set of institutions and tools which differ from one country to another, mainly to foster dialogue in the first place, and then to find you know, common decision or to try to make some consensus-based decisions amongst the heter heterogeneous uh, population, actually. If we were a homogeneous population, we wouldn't need democracy because everyone would have the same opinion. So actually, the, you know, it's about finding an agreement amongst very different people. And I think being here in Brussels, obviously, you know, uh, Brussels, you know, the European Union is very diverse. And as you know, Switzerland is quite diverse as well. So if you look at the Swiss institutions, first of all, what about the, you know, the elite? Who are they? So if you look at the Federal Council, which is the government of Switzerland, you actually have four parties represented. Uh, who work at the college, and they span pretty much the entire political spectrum, from the socialists on the left to the nationalistic or you know, conservative right on the, uh, on the right, and Christian Democrats and more business-oriented right-wing people in the middle. Then you have two chambers of parliament, one of them which represents the cantons, the other one which represents uh, uh, the population, and these two chambers have the same parties, but they have extra parties as well. Most members of parliament are actually non-professionals. So they come from tons of different backgrounds. You have nurses, you have doctors, you have farmers, you have tons of different people in parliament who spend their time obviously discussing uh, uh, tons of issues and trying to find agreements. Now, what about direct democracy? More often than not, it's one of these parties that actually launches a referendum. It's not just the way you describe it. I mean, it happens as well, but most of the time, it's actually one of these parties or perhaps the unions or some kind of a constituted body which has a say in Swiss politics. And more often than not, they launch a referendum on an issue which has already been discussed, has been debated for years sometimes before you launch the referendum. The referendum uh, uh, is also sometimes used by some parties in parliament as a threat in the way the parliament works. You know, they say, well, you know, we are a minority, but we think the people out there are on our side. So if you don't amend your proposal, we launch a referendum. So that's how direct, direct democracy works. Once a referendum is put to vote, you have two bodies that have to agree, especially on the initiative right, which is about changing the constitution, which is 
the cantons. So you need a majority of the cantons to agree, but you also need a majority of the population. And actually, this is you know, what I was talking. It's very heterogeneous. And actually, unlike most people think when they have this kind of elite versus people type of view, it's much more difficult to actually reach an agreement in the population or to reach an agreement or, or, or to find a, a consensus, have a dialogue. So that's very complicated. And I think the first mistake that probably the people from uh, Folgeld made is that this initiative came totally out of the blue. By the time people started debating it, the text was set, had been drafted, it was just too late to change anything, and uh, it was uh, sent that way with very little prior contact with the political establishment and the parties, trying to find at least some support. I mean, no, as you said, none of the parties, none of them, even the small far-left parties gave a, a yes recommendation. There were some yes recommendations in some cantonal parties, like in Geneva, which perhaps explains why you had uh, a higher vote. In Geneva, probably the Greens, the, the far-left, and the Socialists recommended yes, and then also some kind of populist uh, uh, party recommended that as well. But beyond that, you know, there was no prior dialogue. So I think that's, in my opinion, the first mistake. Now, another thing I'd like to talk about is for most people, when we talk about monetary reform, money, the debate gets very quickly, very confusing. And as you said, you know, during the campaign, people said different things. And then, you know, add on top of that, you know, people who like gold and people who like cryptocurrencies. And it's, it's a mess. And the reason why it's a mess, I think, is because I th to some extent, we, uh, we underestimate in the kind of general media to which extent the 2008 crisis was a dramatic shock to the uh, an, an intellectual shock. It was basically a huge trauma. And who better than Alan Greenspan to actually uh, say, you know, or represent that shock. And he gave an interview in two, October 2008, so before the actually depth of the crisis, and famously said that, you know, he and a lot of other people were in state of shocked disbelief. And imagine then if he had been put to sleep for 10 years, woke up now, saw QE, saw, you know, negative interest rates and so much unemployment and virtually no inflation, I mean, probably would have you know, fainted again because of, you know, the shock disbelief. So I think, you know, this is an enormous crisis, intellectual crisis, uh, you know, uh, that is uh, in a way paradigm shifting, but that we haven't come to terms with. And a few years ago, I came across uh, a, a way to analyze, uh, analyze these courses after a crisis, which, you know, actually can be applied to tons of different crises. So I won't go into much details about it, but I have a, here a, a table. And basically, after, and that, that framework has been used to analyze, for example, the intellectual debate after the French Revolution, which was obviously a massive shock to, 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 to society and, and to people's beliefs. Uh, it's been used also to analyze the, some events in the Bible, for example, which some of them were very mm -hmm. dramatic as well. And I think it could be used to analyze the 2008 crisis. Remember that you know, we had gone after you know, 20 years of what was called the Great Moderation. Uh, Gordon Brown you know, famously said in 2007, we will never go back to booms and busts. I mean you know, what happened is a huge shock. And basically you get identified three archetypal uh, responses to a crisis, which apparently are, are quite uh, uh, constant uh, across history. The first one is a scientific one. It's the one that is held by uh, the high civil servants as typically central bankers, for example, in our case. And the legitimacy in talking about the subject comes from their higher education level. And the discourse is mainly about saying, you know, the crisis doesn't mean anything. It doesn't have any meaning. It's just an event that took place, and we're going to try to integrate that event into a historical narrative. Uh, and in that case, when we talk about the 2008 crisis, we just say, well, basically, some people behave badly, so we're going to regulate them a bit more. Um, uh, we made some policy mistakes, for example, Trichet raised rates a bit too, you know, hmm. uh, at the wrong time, twice, actually. And, you know, now we have to just do the opposite. And, uh, uh, but there is nothing you know, dramatic to be done to the system, everything works. You know? And obviously, uh, that's, that's a, a, a view that you can hear very, very loud and clear. Uh, then there is a nostalgic uh, view, which is the people, it's often held by people who have lost some powers, uh, some power. You know, the, the old establishment, which have sometimes lost power to, uh, to uh, the technocrats, for example. And they call upon the tradition. Uh, to actually call for a return to some kind of mythical golden age. And in the case of the 2008, cra 2008 crisis, you can hear them when they criticize public indebtedness. I think the, the cause, you know, often with a kind of moral undertone mm -hmm. about, you know, why we had this crisis. And they generally call for a return to gold and then the kind of new electronic gold, which is probably Bitcoin. 
and uh, they hold generally held conservative values and want rather than more regulation, they want deregulation because they blame it on too much state intervention to the economy for the crisis. And then you would have what you would call the utopi utopian uh, uh, view uh, of the crisis. It's often held by outsiders who have acquired some uh, of some personal knowledge. So they're, they're generally, you know, uh, quite you know smart. They they know how to communicate, but they're outside the the mainstream. And for them, you know, the discourse is more about saying, you know, the crisis is the end of an old world and the beginning of a new world, and they can formulate a vision for a better world. And clearly, anyone who's, you know, probably around this table kind <laughs> of belongs to, you know, more or less a strength to that kind of view. Not that I want to say, you know, it's all about being a utopist, but it's about saying that, you know, this crisis has a meaning. You know, we have to look things, you know, uh, in the eyes of the situation, you know, straight, you know, there is some problem in the system. We need to reform the system. Then people come up with proposals about how to do it. So if you look at the the reformist side, which is the side we, which is debating today, uh, one thing that you have is that probably you have two fronts. So I, I, I've seen here positive money, and I, I'm, I'm taking the opportunity to say that they've done a very good job in terms of being a platform for, you know, international exchanges on these issues. And if you go on their website, on everything which is published on the blogs and articles, etc., you can probably identify two fronts. The first front is the kind of full money front, and the full money front sees problems with the safety of deposits and sometimes, sometimes the power of banks. And this is, I would say, the more academic front. It is more historical front. It's a front that existed already in the 1930s. So you have this kind of Chicago plan, Chicago plan revisited and all that. It's all about you know, the, the blaming of the fractional reserve, uh, uh, fractional reserve system and, we, and sometimes on you know, some kind of power that the banks have. And then you have another front, uh, which is more like the QE for the people front. It's people who probably, a front that appeared really after the crisis, when you look at what were central banks were doing, and then you're just like, you're a bit puzzled, you know, that should lead to inflation, that should lead to jobs, you know, what, what's going on? And uh, people whose primary concern is probably uh, more about employment and the allocation of resources, but that perhaps purchasing power. And, and I think the approach is it's, it's quite different. In the end, we'll see that there is a common link between all these approaches, but in terms of discourse, it's slightly different. And if I can you know, formulate my second criticism about the initiative is that they came, in my opinion, from the wrong side, which was a side which was rather abstract, rather academic, and as you said, that no one had experience. I mean, when was the last uh, loss on people's deposits in Switzerland? I don't know. I don't even know if there were any in 1930s yeah, or not. But I mean, small bank in tune. Yeah, uh, but it's, the 90s it's maybe. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But it's, it's a, an experience that, but they really lost money? Um, the depositors lost money, like 300 million altogether. Okay. Yeah. But it's, a, it's something very marginal that no one experiences. Whereas jobs, when you talk about an economic subject, jobs is something that people care. And, uh, uh, and so that's probably the side where I'm from, uh, the more political, I would say, side and, uh, and the less academic or historical side. So now I'm going to talk about money and my view about money and the, and, and, and the economy. And I'd like to ask you a question. Who thinks in this room that yeah. we've reached such a high level of civilization that you know all needs, you know, individual and collective needs are fulfilled, that all aspirations have been met? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then the question well, is, you know, I think who, they could be met. We just don't no, decide no, no, no. to allocate. No, no, no. Who thinks that they have, they have, okay. they have been met? That we've done, you know, there is no work basically. Is there is there no work to be done? There is work to be done. I can find a whole list of things to be done. <laughs> people don't know what to do. Why is there unemployment then? Why are people who could do something to fulfill some of these needs, some of these demands, and are not working? And this is a paradox. We got used to this paradox, but it's a paradox nonetheless. And I think the explanation for this paradox comes from uh, the, the, the division of labor. The division of labor, in a, you know, to some extent, is a very recent phenomenon. It's not much more than 100 to 200 years. Before that, the vast majority of the population, definitely in Switzerland and the Alps, were subsistence farmers. There was no division of labor whatsoever. So the division of labor is a, is a new phenomenon, and it's something that is actually growing rapidly, very rapidly. I mean, no one now just cultivates their vegetables, no one repairs their cars, no one builds their, you know, uh, their, their house, etc. But that division of work, a uh, division of labor, implies that we only work if someone pays us to do so. 
So if only we only work if someone with their money pays us to work. And so the question is, where does money come from? I'm excluding everything which is about volunteering and all that, yeah, obviously. But I don't know. <laughs> I'm talking about the vast majority of the economy, not okay. the margins, okay? But, you know, we know that some things like, you know, this projector there, the camera and everything, you know, is a division of labor that does that. Hmm. So where does the money come from? Um, and that's the, that's the main question, in my opinion. And as we've discussed it, it's lent into existence, as the expression goes. So banks lend money, as they lend, they create money. This money goes into the economy, and obviously people who have borrowed money at some point need to repay it. And then as it's repaid, it's being destroyed. So we have this cycle where banks lend money, economy has the, you know, that kind of generate demands, and then uh, it goes back when it's repaid, and keep in mind it's repaid with interest, which means that you need to repay more than what has been lending to the first place. And the current system is, uh, because of that structure, ineffective, inefficient, and unstable. Why is it ineffective? I don't think I need to say it, because, you know, just look at unemployment. It's ineffective in, in, in actually creating enough employment, at least today. It's inefficient in the sense that uh, um, you, you have to put more and more means to actually get a similar outcome, which is, for example, 1 or 2% inflation. And, and then it's unstable, as we said, and we've seen during the crisis. I don't think I need to explain why. And the reason is that if you look at the demand, so GDP by demand, the vast majority of the demand comes from consumption. So the vast majority of the demand in the economy can't be financed by credit, or shouldn't at least. You shouldn't finance uh, consumption through credit. And so uh, uh, the vast majority of the demand cannot be stimulated through our monetary system. And then you say, well, okay, but there is a pretty much a quarter, at least as the Keynes in Switzerland, I think, worldwide, which is a, 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 a gross formation of capital, so investment, basically. But when you look at investment, not all of it can be financed by uh, credit and, and bank loans. Vast majority, if you look at national accounts, the vast majority of the balance sheet of companies comes from uh, actually equity, not from debt. So, and, and, and that's going to be perhaps more and more the case as we move towards a surface-oriented economy uh, and towards a uh, perhaps more based on, on human capital rather than you know, uh, fixed capital uh, and machines and land and, and mines, etc. So, so uh, and that's the case even within the financial sector. Sometimes the people say, oh, you know, you're a banker, that's why you're against full credit. No, I mean, uh, 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 a fund management company like us can't really get a bank loan. Bank loan. <coughs> I mean, the only assets we have are computers and then the intellectual property. So the, I think the vast majority of our economies are moving towards, you know, something which can't be financed uh, through loans and debt. And then when you look at debt, with the growth, uh, the, the, the growth of capital markets, Debt is, to some extent, also uh, uh, financed through the issuance of bonds, which is not actually creating money. Mm -hmm. It's just a transfer of money from people, from savers to uh, 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 borrowers. So basically, we're trying to get money through the hole of a needle, basically. And what happens is that it's, that's why it's ineffective, to some extent, and that's why it's inefficient uh, in, a fan, in the sense that then this credit spills over and then can finance the purchasing of existing assets and, re, you know, and bring prices up to potentially an unstable lab, level. So the general solution for people who agree with that you know, analysis is that we need more sovereign money. And now I'm going to talk about my third criticism of the initiative is that... What do you mean by sovereign money? Okay. So it's money issued by the state. Okay. And I have... Uh, I know that often people talk about coins and banknotes in a different way, but actually I'm really talking about money issued by the treasury, which is only coins, actually. And so uh, I'm going to talk about how it works in a minute. Go ahead. So in my opinion, what we need is more sovereign money to stimulate the economy in a more efficient way. But what people from the Folgate Initiative ask for is just to replace the entire system overnight with, you know, you remove the, you know, that system here and you replace it by the new system, which is this one. The state spends money into the economy. <coughs> That's how uh, uh, sovereign money actually works. And then, you know, it removes money from the economy by taxing it. No one really knows what the history is about money. I think it really started in like a prehistorical time, but it might be that actually that's how money worked. Uh, start in the first place. 
States started paying soldiers with, you know, coins. People at the time who had never seen money wouldn't care less about receiving coins. They wanted to receive bread or anything or clothes or anything. And then what they are, the state asked then is, you know, they ask farmers to stop paying taxes in wheat or any other kind of uh, goods, but to pay it in the coins they had issued. And that's how you create demand in the economy for those coins, and that's how you can use them to spend. And so when you do that, you know, money is not lent into existence, it's spent into existence. Then there are several things that you can do. You can spend it in public spending, pretty much, uh, uh, basically. Or another kind of you know, idea that is talked about a lot is to spend it indirectly by double, first distributing it to the households, and then they spend it into the economy. So uh, I'm going to get to the, the conclusion. So um, I, you know, I, I've, I've been involved in the kind of debate about uh, um, uh, the reform of the monetary system in Switzerland for a while, but without some kind of committee, just on my own, getting to talk to some parties, uh, to some lobbies, and then eventually writing a book. Uh, and uh, and I keep on doing that, and perhaps you know we'll uh, uh, we'll move into something more formal. Uh, uh, in the future. But I'm going to tell you what I wrote about uh, already a few years ago that I had received some attention actually in the Swiss media. Is, uh, but yeah, first I'm going to describe what it was. And basically it was almost the opposite of the full Geld approach, mm -hmm. which was I tried to be as minimalistic as possible, saying, you know, I don't want to have a huge disruption. I know the type of oppositions you faced, which was, you know, why change something that kind of works? So what you want to do is that to have uh, uh, something which is an, as minimalistic as possible. Uh, it's the best way to reach the widest consensus. Then I wanted to focus on the real economy because that's what mattered to me, but also that's what matters to most people, I think. So it probably you have more chances of success when you talk about that rather than some kind of abstract thing that people don't experience. Then I think it's very important, and we're going to talk about that probably when we also look at what could be done in the uh, European Union or in the Eurozone, is taking into account the practicalities because you can have great ideas and often economies come and they have you know, hu very interesting ideas but they never take into account both political realities but also you know, how do you do it. And in a way, because of the nature of the Swiss system, the referendum can only change the constitution and that was perhaps the third, you know, the fourth uh, problem with the initiative is that you make a, a very general uh, um, uh, constitutional uh, article and then you leave it to the legislator, that is the parliament, to just look at the practicalities and, and, and produce a law. And that's one of the criticism at least I heard in, in you know in, in, in French. I don't know if it was one of the criticism there, but I saw some MPs saying, you know, well we have no clue, you know, what 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 can we do? Uh, we don't know what you're talking about, then you know it's up to us to find a a, a, a law to define, you know, how it'll work in practice. And and that left a lot of kind of uh, uh, uncertainties about what system we were actually voting on. And then something I've done uh, as well in my, you know, at my small level was to try, as I said, to engage with all parties and lobbies prior to perhaps one day drafting a text and launch an initiative. So my proposal is pretty simple. is to just authorize the Swiss National Bank to distribute what I call the monetary ration to every resi resident. So I wouldn't change the, 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 uh, the banking, system, banking system. I wouldn't change the mandate of the central bank. Uh, I would just give it one extra tool in its toolbox. And so... You could distribute money, that's an extra tool that the, the Swiss National Bank has, can do it if it wants, it can not do it if it doesn't want, and that money is created as sovereign money. Okay? And it happens that in Switzerland we have a very interesting tool linked to our insurance, uh, 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 health insurance, which is that it's very easy, uh, or very easy, it's already done actually on, on so, uh, for some kind of small tax, it's very easy to distribute money to the entire population every month if you want because everyone in Switzerland has uh, one health insurance. It's some kind of semi-centralized system where health insurances are private, but then you know, they all report to a central authority. And, uh, and so you could actually distribute very small amounts, which is also important because if you want the tool to be minimalistic, you want it to be flexible and you know, perhaps to start very, very small amounts. And uh, that tool uh, uh, can allow for you know the distribution, uh, as I said, very small uh, amounts of money to basically everyone in Switzerland. It's already used to, for example, uh, uh, return some uh, CO2 tax to to the to the population to make it, for example, tax neutral. Um, so I think that's it. So um, I'm going to leave you uh, with the reference of my books. I've brought some free copies for those who speak French. 
It's only in French for the moment. Uh, and that's it for me. Super, thank you very much. Um, before we go for your questions, I, I wanted to challenge you on one thing. So you see this division between QE for people and Pussy Money. Uh, but I think actually, and that's the way I presented it, to me, the f full money proposal, Volgel, is both at the same time. Because the day you decide that private banks cannot create money, you need to figure out how you create money. Right. So in a way, it's a, it's a bundle. I agree that it's more minimalistic to, to propose the, the, the QE for people approach, but it's not really uh, uh, a complete opposition. No, you know, that's true. So that's why I talked about an approach to the problem rather than right. two different solutions. Okay. It's just, you know, the angle from which you attack the problem, but also the angle from which you present the problem to the wider public and to the parties and lobbies is very different. For example, just to give you an example, when I talked, I've wrote an article uh, in two, the two leading newspapers in Switzerland, one in, in German and one in French, uh, about my proposal in 2015. And then the first thing I did was just to send an email to all the major lobbies and uh, uh, the major parties in Switzerland to see you know, if there were some interest in discussing the issue. I got very little answers, but I got an answer from you know, one lobby, uh, which actually is being very supportive to me, uh, and especially its president. Uh, it's a lobby of, uh, uh, um, which is called Swiss Trade. It's a lobby of retail retailers, uh, car sellers, etc. Because obviously for them it makes a huge difference. I mean, if you increase the purchasing power to the population, you already have, you know, uh, uh, some kind of lobby which has an interest. So I mean, why should, and that's true for any kind of pro political proposal, be it in parliament or in, in the shape of a referendum, you need to alienate as, many, as fewer people as possible and to try <coughs> to find as many people who see a benefit in it. Mm -hmm. And second question, so if you think this approach could be more successful, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled because I tend to think of the Swiss society as being very conservative. As, as you were saying, uh, it's already a very wealthy country, so if you if you want to, and you, you said the, the main argument for creating more money as opposed to changing the old money system is employment, allocation of resources. Do, is it, do you think it will appeal to the Swiss population who, according to you, we, we already have everything? So how do you kind of... Well, uh, uh, there are several answers to that. First of all, as I said, the Swiss population is not as homogeneous as people think. So yes, it's more conservative. I think there is a language difference here, yeah. where which side is more conservative than the <laughs> other. I think there is also, you know, where you come from, it's for more, more urban or more you know, mountain uh, uh, regions. And I think there is also, it's true, Switzerland always ranks top in terms of aggregated indicators, uh, but I think it's somehow misleading. Mm. Uh, obviously, you know, we don't face some of the situations that you have, for example, with, you know, youth unemployment in some of the Southern European countries. But uh, I, I don't think it's as rosy as you would think, and you know, one of the symptoms of that is the strength of some of the populist parties we have in Switzerland, for example. Right. So I mean, not, uh, it's not as rosy. Just to give you a few examples. First, the way we count unemployment in Switzerland, and we've been like several times uh, told off by the uh, labor, international labor organization, we don't count tons of people who are technically unemployed but are not in the statistics. Mm -hmm. For example, if you stop receiving your unemployment benefits, you're not unemployed anymore. If you do in the unemployment, you have what they call auxiliary ga uh, revenues, mm. you're not unemployment any unemployed anymore. So there are tons of people who don't count in the stati are not counting the statistics. Then you have people who have jobs, and that's probably linked to the fact that Swiss system is, you know, it's easy to hire, it's easy to fire. Okay, so that's one of the things which often generates higher jobs. It doesn't mean that people don't have uncertainty about their future. Mm. So you can have a job and still feel uh, the, the, the threat or the, the uncertainty about your future situation. So there is this. Then obviously there is the other aspect which is the allocation of, of resources. You know, a lot of people wish for a different economy and, uh, and I think, you know, monetary system, you know, the way money enters the economy has a direct impact on how the allocation, how the resources are allocated. It's not just some kind of, you know, you take a port of entry and then instantaneously money spreads into the economy. So, you know, it has, it has a point, and you can imagine that a lot of people, at least on the left side of the political spectrum, but also, I think, on the center, 
uh, might be interested in, in uh, 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 you know, reforming that aspect. Mm. And finally, even for people who are you know, pro-market and pro-everything, you know, uh, uh, and even the banks in a way, might be in favor as well because the insta instability of the system leads to very and more and more bureaucratic legislation to try to stabilize it. And I think there are people who fight that, and we've seen that in the United States, for example, some form of deregulation now. Yeah. Uh, uh, but people know that you, know, you can't have both. You know, it's going to be difficult to have both. So I think most parties might find that you know they have an interest in having a more stable, a more prosperous economy thanks to a reform of the monetary system. Okay, thanks. Um, do you want to respond quickly and then we go to the? Yeah, you you. What the fantastic thing is, you only have one little paradigm change you have to address, and that is um, the religious-like belief that uh, monetary finance is like the devil, you know, and. Here you only have that. You only have to convince the people that, in a very very small amount, monetary finance can actually do some good. And I think this is this is kind of convincing. W what what we realize is we have so many issues that are unorthodox, really unorthodox. That you 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 end up uh, explaining half an hour what you actually want. Yeah. And if you only have a, a very little specific mm. um, issue that at this point is not considered or an orthodox option to, to um, go into the future because it's kind of uh, um, not part of the tool set of the dominant political economy. It's like an epistemic constraint, if you would say so. And this, but this is, this is something you can debate. If you have a, if you have a, um, a good uh, argument why um, you should inject a very small amount of money the way you su suggest, like into the, um, the health system, then then pr probably you, you you have also a, a long debate, but you only have one tiny issue. You're always debating this little tiny issue, and eventually you maybe um, convince your opponents. Yeah, I think the what what you mentioned is the only. I would say w well formulated criticism about that is always the kind of you know the it's it it looks like the Pandora box yeah when if you if you start financing public spending with uh, monetary creation then you know I think there is a huge taboo there and I think that's why I think you left it vague in the referendum you know it mm. wouldn't be clear and that's why I went straight for you know no 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 the state budgetary discipline still has to be there you know we just give it to households and individuals. And, and that's a first way to, to, uh, to, to remove that. But then the, the, on, uh, the other criticism is that, you know, the people will put a lot of political pressure on the monetary authority to, uh, to actually distribute more. I think that fear is held by people who have the kind of, you know, romanticized view about democracy, where they see the people as this kind of black mass of incompetent uh, <laughs> people. I think it's totally unfounded. Probably there is more pressure now from cantons and some political parties for the Swiss National Bank to distribute a dividend, which it does uh, on a regular basis, than there would be for some households to receive uh, 50 francs, uh, you know, or 100 francs, or, you know, uh, I think, you know, it's, uh, but anyway, I mean, you're right. I mean, and, that's, and that goes back to my discussion about democracy. Just narrow down the issue as little as possible to make sure that you don't have to fight on all fronts at the same time. Mm. Mm. Okay, great. But perhaps um, just one thing I can mention as well, <laughs> uh, and you wanted to have a... Yeah, now, I think it's ten to open. You know where uh, you know where it can where the monetary reform made 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 appear. It might come from a totally different angle. We've had some members of parliament in Switzerland who have asked for the the government to work on uh, the Swiss National Bank issuing cryptocurrencies, hmm. and some of the leading figures doing that are people who are leading figures against the full Geld initiative. But what they don't realize is that they're opening the they're opening the way for sovereign money, basically, because yeah. this is yeah. nothing else than sovereign money. And as soon as you do that, the first question is, you know, once you've created the money, what do you do with it? Hmm. And um, so anyway. Okay, great. Your turn. Um, feel free to ask any question. Come on, I'm sure you have plenty of. Quentin, you had the uh, Quentin, you had the. Uh, uh, but. My question is more about the uh, Folgert Initiative. May, may I? I yes, am, sure. I'm, I'm wondering how d you decide to, to speak about um, central banks exclusively create new money in your, in your model, and uh, why you didn't spoke about 50 for the central bank or 50 for the commercial bank, and maybe, uh, you know, 
why it's only the central bank who inject the new money in the economy and why um, you, you didn't uh, find like a halfway uh, mm. position, halfway, half, halfway proposal, because I think the most critic, tri critical people mm. uh, told you that it was you are too radical. Yes. Or, or maybe, I don't know, only uh, money creation for commercial banks for uh, productive uh, credits yes. mm. and uh, no more uh, speculation. Yes, you, you first, for maybe you need to find out, um, you know, what the reaction is on your proposal. And, uh, you know, the, the sovereign money idea um, existed. We, we didn't invent sovereign money. We didn't invent the concept. You know, there's a professor, Josef Huber, from, from Germany, who, who uh, is uh, one of the, the leading thinkers. And there is uh, also Ben Dyson um, in, in England, who was the founder of positive money. And, and um, both of them had the idea that... that um, or the vision that you should uh, you, you should take away the power of creating money from from private banks and give it to the state and make money a uh, public good, and um, so so what we did is actually we took this concept that pre-existed mm -hmm. and and um, formulated uh, an initiative text that. Um, was um, specifically well done, I think, in order to uh, make sure that the law that actually is is um, um, based on the text in the end really uh, make makes sure that banks cannot kind of circumvent the the concept. If it we 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 face also criticism that um, that we didn't um, uh, consider the boundary problem of financial regulations that the banks always find a way to circumvent regulation, but you know not to make a law because you're afraid that the the law doesn't have an impact. It's just you know it didn't make sense uh, to us. So so but but we took the concept and and tried and then and now we we are we are much much smarter you know after the initiative we I think <laughs> we, 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 we we learned a lot you know for us we were all a kind of uh, newbies we we didn't have uh, much uh, experience in with politics and and um, and um, so so f for us now actually the time starts to to reflect on on all the arguments that uh, were we're posing the initiative, and now we kind of have to um, to to uh, make good choices where to go from here. Hmm. Learning, we, there's, I'm, I'm sure we'll uh, we, we'll we'll learn a lot um, if we if we take the time. And uh, hmm. but one one of the aspects you mentioned is w what is speculative and what is not speculative. That's you know very hard to define. And if you think of it, what is speculative in most countries is just households buying a house. Yeah. That's the problem, you know. It's just, you know, it's not what people think like some kind of banker playing around with the stock market. It's the vast majority, 90% of mortgage uh, of debt, bank loans in Switzerland are mortgages, and most of them, the vast majority of them, are on households. So, so you know. Yeah, but you can say people who, who build or uh, own our house is not speculation. But if one guy all uh, build like uh, hundreds house. That's speculation. No, well, no, because it's one company. The pr what what you call speculation is is w the only thing you can say is that you know if you get a loan to buy something that exists, you're not financing the economy. But when you do, th I mean, obviously, in most countries, the vast majority of the real estate market is already built. Yeah. So you know, most house purchases I mean in Switzerland we we probably have a bu bubble I mean it's difficult yes. to tell in the first you know you always tell it afterwards but I mean my parents bought a house uh, 20 years ago or 25 years ago and now pr you know it was worth like three times more now and so my generation comes into the uh, real estate market and just finds it normal to just get a 1 million Swiss loan you know and that, that's what you know could fall under speculation I don't think it's speculation it's just you know you want to live, interest rates are low there, and then you just adapt your loan to, you know, to where you can, what you can do in terms of your income. And so it, it's very difficult. And I think that's one of the issues you face as well, to define what is money creation. I mean, at some point, you know, a voucher that is issued by uh, uh, some kind of shop is already some form of money. And actually, you know, it sounds a bit stupid, but in some places it's been used uh, as money, in the Middle Ages, a lot of the money that was actually circulating the economy were some form of vouchers issued by shops. So, I mean, you can't ban 
that's what, one of the issues you had as well, is that you can't ban anyone from committing to something. And what this money created by bank is, is a commitment to deliver to you uh, cash. So if I commit to you to, you know, pay you a beer afterwards, you know, it's just uh, there in the air. You know, the people from Fulgate were calling that fake money. But if I say, you know, oh, that promise is transferable, you can transfer it to whoever you want. You know, I've created money yeah. of, the, uh, oh, no, of the price of a beer in Brussels. <laughs> Yeah, and if we go back to your proposition, you, um, I think, from an Argentinian point uh, of yeah. view, uh, you have uh, the problem that you believe you believe in politicians, you believe in the public sector who is who will finally create the money. And my question is, especially when you go to money destruction, because you say, okay, you pay taxes and you distract, and you distract money. With the, yeah. With the taxes, I think you you could uh, uh, believe that from a Swiss point of view, but in somewhere else, cannot work. Well, obviously, I give here. We didn't have time to have a full presentation about you know all the intricacies of, of, of that system. What I presented here is just basically the big, basic idea of sovereign money. It's issued as a leg and tender, and that it has a. Uh, uh, basically uh, liberatory power towards your obligation to pay taxes and that's how you create demand and you, you give value to, to sovereign money um, it's not about believing in politicians or not you know we have institutions everywhere, all countries have institutions and I don't think it can work without any institutions so you have to you know what we've done as well is to separate monetary authorities from from fiscal or budget uh, authorities but I mean, a dysfunctional society is a dysfunctional society in any aspects. I mean, I don't think, you know, that can be blamed on, you know, uh, I think at some point we, you know, we need some kind of institutions that have some power and uh, to executive power, money or monetary policy is one of these ex executive powers. Yes, obviously, I'm very confident in the fact that the Swiss uh, institutions work, you know, well, you know, you can always criticize them, but uh, they work pretty well. And there is some kind of good level of governance and balance of power. And uh, and that's it. But you you know you're not against policy mistakes, but you, you know that's the case now as well. And I think what's happening now is that you know we perhaps have. That's perhaps something you wanted to touch upon. So I mean I don't know if I should talk about. Yeah, it now. I was about to. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think there's one issue, one aspect uh, of the Swiss referendum as well that struck me uh, very much is the role of the Swiss National Bank. Uh, Central Bank is supposed to be independent, uh, to not interfere in political debate. And under the name of in the independence, the Swiss National Bank said, Volga is a bad idea for independence, so we are against it, and, we're and they, they were, yes. as you were saying, they were at the forefront of the opposition to the campaign. So isn't that a paradox for central bank independence? Uh, and I don't know, how do you both appreciate the role of this SNB? Do you think it was, uh, it was justified, or was, did they overstep what they had to do? I don't know. Perhaps I, that's I think you have to you have to be uh, fair and say you have no chance to win uh, a referendum on monetary reform if the institution you want to give more power and the, the institution <coughs> who should issue the money in the end doesn't want what you want to give it. You know, then then you know it's just it's very unlikely that you that you succeed. And um, and I think uh, it was very well um, strategically very well planned. You know how all the campaign against us in the end um, um, turned out. I mean, I mean the, the Thomas, Thomas uh, Jordan, the president of the Swiss National Bank, waited until, to, uh, until the hot phase before the referendum began, and then he came out with, uh, with, with his opinion. And then he, he really, um, he was often in the papers, and he held um, presentations, and... Uh, and he was qu quoted. Um, he was he was omnipresent. He was everywhere, and uh, and uh, this in the end, you know, this this uh, this al almost uh, yes, this killed our uh, our whole strategy. Do you think the SNB polit politicized itself, and do you think there will be consequences this is in no, the future? There will not will not be any consequences. But it's absolutely clear that you know Thomas Jordan was was standing uh, in front of a, a huge audience. Um, Arguing against for the Folgeld initiative and saying with the Folgeld initiative the the SMB would be poli more politicized, 
yeah, yeah you know so what he did is was it was a perfect example of how the SMB in this moment was politicized you know it was he was he, he was doing exactly what he was told to do but he's you know he's a civil servant he he just does what he's supposed to do and in this moment he was told <laughs> that he should oppose uh, the the initiative you, you say that he was told yeah, I mean, you know, I wasn't in the room His when he, <laughs> by, the by the, by the, the you know, who is that you have to say. You know, when, 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 the finance, when the finance minister calls uh, the director of the central bank, then he listens and at least, you know, sits down with him. And then if you have, if you have um, a whole expert committee who in the end formulated um, the, um, the strategic approach how Swiss banking regulation should work, it's called, it was called the uh, um, Brunetti Committee, it, it, he's, he's a professor for finance and economics and he was the leader to, and, and together with uh, the CEOs of five or six banks and some other civil servants they built a group and this group was put in place after the financial crisis to to um, to um, formulate the the strategy how um, this uh, the the Swiss banking system can become more resilient, and you know this is if if um, if if this group together you know decides that this is the right way and Fallgeld is absolutely the wrong way you know and then and then you you even if you're if you're the director of the Swiss National Bank you just you, you you follow this lead. Hmm. I, in that group, you I, had some uh, well-known economists. Of course, it, it was. So, well, and they were independent. It was. What, what, is independent what is independent and what is not independent? You any, uh, but you, you, you have some people like Dantino or someone like that, who, who is uh, who has their own ideas. So uh, they they will express their ideas. Who was against your idea? I think that. Okay. That comes to the side, no. you have to present. Yeah, well, no, no, I mean, I mean uh, for me, I totally disagree with that view actually. Because I, see, if, I, if you, you know, if I can start with just a, a, par a parenthesis, we've we've be we've become very confused. In the 19, early nineteen nineties, you know, we had a core, you know that's the end of history. Politics doesn't exist anymore. It's just about technocrats, basically. You know, we just need to adjust a few things. But overall, there is no politics anymore. And this was, we see. A total mistake and I think the surge you know we see after the crisis a, a comeback of politics a very strong comeback and it comes to populist parties at the moment but I think it's a recognition that you know when you hold power you're never neutral and so to go back to the central bank the central bank is executive power it's it's it, it's a holder of executive power it has a very very narrow power but it's still a branch of government and when you are at the head of the of the, the, the central bank you actually hold a political power. And my call is actually to recognize that, not to say that they're neutral, because you're never neutral when you have a power. And I don't want someone who drives a car, gets into the wall, and was told, well, you know, and doesn't take responsibility for it, and says, well, you know, the lines had me, you know, led me to, to hit the wall. You know, you have power, and you have to, uh, to, you have to uh, assume that power, and assume that, to some extent, you make some trade-offs which are political, even on a narrow field, like, monetary policy. I think there are some studies showing, for example, that, you know, the older the central bankers, the more uh, a hawky is, uh, which is, you know, <laughs> obviously, as the older you are, the less inflation you want, and the younger you are, the more inflation you want. Just a, it's just a kind of example. But, so, I think the Swiss National Bank was totally right, and its president uh, was totally right to actually intervene in the debate on a subject that mattered to to, 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 to monetary policy. I don't think there is any conspiracy uh, theory. These people, the three of them, uh, at the board, they uh, they uh, they make decisions. They hear people. Obviously, they discuss. Obviously, there is they have networks. Uh, they primarily technocrats, so they're gonna look to you know what is the kind of mainstream you know uh, uh, idea, uh, and they're gonna listen to a lot of people. But in the end, for example, when they saved UBS, I think just a few people knew uh, what was to happen, and they made a decision on their own. So I think they even won the government. I think the, the same morning that mm. they did it. So they had. There is no kind of, you know, they they're definitely independent. They definitely hold the power, and this is a political power. So I think they're right mm. to intervene. Obviously, I wasn't necessarily uh, in agreement with what they were saying, but uh, perhaps they were right to intervene. But 
not for the good reasons because the reason they intervened is because they felt the independence was being no, threatened. The, the, the and as you say, they, they shouldn't be they shouldn't be independent maybe in the first place. I mean, at least they shouldn't no, the claim to be completely independent. or completely In natural. all countries, the parliament is independent from government. Mm. Um, you know, then there are some links which are given stronger, but generally it's two independent bodies. The parliament legislates on how the government mm. acts. The government sometimes replies and tells the parliament, well, if you do that, there will be this consequence and it's, we're against it, etc. It happens all the time. Yeah. Executive powers and legislators are always arguing. So they're just a branch of this executive power mm. and they're arguing as well. That's all. Okay. But there's very much power. And, 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 so, and, and really this kind of neutrality, for me, I'd, I'd rather have that and assume that power than having yeah. this kind of hiding behind neutrality. Mm. Because when they were, for example, challenged about their investments, you know, the Swiss National Bank holds for more than uh, 100 billion Swiss francs in equities, uh, in stocks, basically, mm, yeah. across the world. And they were holding companies involved in some activities which are illegal in Switzerland, like uh, uh, linked to nuclear weapons, for example, uh, fragmentation, what they call like these uh, fragmentation bombs, bombs, and all that. And then, you know, you have Dantin, who was actually asked, you know, about that after he was at the board, <coughs> and was like, oh, we know, we're neutral, we don't make, you know, it's not our responsibility to put a judgment on that. I mean, you're there just pressing the button on buying things. You have to ask yourself all these questions. Are you financing competitors of Swiss companies? Are you financing activities which go against the goal of, of the government? Mm. I mean, these are legitimate questions, and you don't, I don't want these people to hide behind some kind of scientific neutrality. Great. You had a question? Yeah, but he uh, still wants to respond. Yeah, I, w I want to just quickly to say, and I think generally we have to discuss um, the power of central bankers. You know, um, we 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 have there some institutions that um, during the last ten years became incredibly powerful, and they're kind of you know independent and not democratically legitimated. So, so so there is there is there is um, Mario Draghi here uh, at the ECB, or there is uh, Thomas Jordan, and you know I don't know how he makes his, his decisions, why he makes his decisions. Yeah, he has a network, and then he, he makes up his minds and um, his mind, and then he he, he decides to do uh, something. But the impact it has is huge, and um, and it's very hard to to challenge a decision he makes. It's almost impossible from a democratic um, point of, of view. Uh, yeah. So, mm. so this is this is something an, an issue we have to we have to yeah. discuss in the and future. And there are plenty of issues they refuse to di to discuss yeah. publicly because they say, oh, we are independent, so it's not our remit. Yeah. But of course, but there are there are overlaps. But exactly, you don't want yeah. that. I mean, I, I was discussing I to we'll MPs, and they were telling me, well, if the Swiss National Bank asks for that reform, we know we'll put it in the law. And then you talk to the Swiss National Bank, and they say, well, you know, uh, you know, it's not up to us to define our mandate. So people were just, you know, not taking responsibilities. Mm. And it's something we see, I mean, here at Pusimony as well, every time we lobby MEPs, they say, oh, we cannot say that because that would, that would mean we are telling the ECB what to do. Yeah. And then when we speak to the ECB, we say, they say, oh, we don't take instruction from MEPs, but uh, we have a mandate. Uh, but in a way, they kind of tell us, well, actually, if the parliament would tell us to do that, you know, of course, we would consider. So I think there's a lot of, uh, but anyway, um, over to you. But so can, can I propose to, so is your question around what can monetary policy do for uh, climate change and so on, sustainability? Is that what you want to... Not necessarily is climate change, but like more, how can we move away from a growth model? Right. Yeah. Okay. 
do you want to well just one remark is that it's not because you make one small step that you can't make further steps afterwards i think there is as i said i think it's a paradigm shift and it's very difficult to to make many steps at the same time and it's also very difficult to entangle that with other issues and i think to some extent i mean you, you've been campaigning as well uh, i guess yeah. here i mean you know whatever my views are about climate change about uh, the environment about social responsibility of companies and all these issues which are obviously very important if i try to t you know attach them to everything you propose then you know as i said you alienate everyone at the same time my strong belief is that once you start changing the way money is injected into the economy you do have the power to change the allocation of resources then you know as we, live in, we live in a democracy it might be that the majority of the population doesn't want actually to fight climate change who knows i think they do but i think people are more scared of losing their jobs than, and, and that's where the, the trade-off comes. When you're faced with the reality where you have a boss who tells you, you know, if we do go in that direction, I'm going to have to fire you, uh, and, and then you, know, uh, uh, you, you choose very quickly. And I think this is really linked to the way we create uh, money. Because in principle, again, that's a paradox that we have. You know, we have this paradox where actually destroying wealth is kind of creating wealth. Yeah? I mean, you, you do things that no one wants to do, like uh, mm. destroying a beautiful park or something or a forest, uh, but that actually that's adding to GDP. But this is, be this is exactly because the logic, so money is, is so important that the logic of how money is created then applies to the entire economy. If you add costs to borrowers, you reduce the injection of money into the economy and you threaten jobs. It's not, it doesn't have to be that way, but because of the current system, it is very much that way. And so we, we, we puzzled into basically doing weird things where we don't allocate the resources where we want to allocate them, and we allocate them where we don't want to allocate them. And then a lot of them remain unallocated at all. So I think, you know, it's a small step. It might take some time to actually change the balance in all these things. We might have debates about, you know, environmental laws, about uh, labor laws and all these things. Probably all countries have different models, but uh, I think it's actually what appears as a small change is a huge change. Mm -hmm. But I can't forecast what, as democracies, which direction we will want to take. Mm -hmm. That I can't forecast, and I don't want to put it into my proposal, because then I'm putting two proposals at once. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you had a question? Yes, about the campaign. It's very difficult to raise the attention of people on such topics, mm. uh, financing, right? the need to reform finance in general. So what did you do to attract their attention? What kind of uh, materials did you, did you <laughs> use to, uh, to explain in simple words uh, the need for, for everyone to feel concerned by the, uh, by the issue? Okay, uh, what, what we um, tried to do is we, we wanted to ask a question to everyone and we wanted to um, create an image of us that um, we are the ones that actually are the first who really um, talk to the public and ask this question who should create money you know usually if you have a campaign in Switzerland the party says we want that and then there's an exclamation mark behind it and we, we were probably the first ever who, um, uh, who, who organized a campaign um, by based on a question and and I, I guess this 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 helped a lot. When when I talked when I talked to um, to people on the streets, then they they really they, they really said, yeah, you know, it 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 never occurred to me to to uh, think about who should create the money because I actually assumed that all the money is created by the Swiss National Bank. And now you guys come and ask this question, and you, you have we ha okay we had we had posters <laughs> and we had we used social media. We we used all the channels. Um, available to to um, to reach out to to the to the public, and um, and and but yeah, what what we wanted is that people start to think. You know, this is this was this was the the, the main idea, and then start maybe also to to try to uh, and and um, and research for themselves. For example, we put on our webpage all the um, the, the media reports. In journals, even if they were against us, even if they were criticizing us, we, we didn't only put our the the, the, the reports in favor of uh, of Volga. No, we we just everything so that people just could could read as much as possible um, written by by whoever economists or journalist or blo blogger, so so that um, 
that yeah that that they can make up um, or form form their um, opinion, and um, what what we underestimated is that the people are just they're really busy. <laughs> one th that's that's one issue. They they have so many things on their agenda, um, and um, and that that they're um, some some of them are are just simply also ignorant. You know they they just they don't care, and um, and and we were probably a little bit. Um, uh, you know, too excited because for for us there, it was you know this is so important this 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 question you know this because we didn't ask ourselves this question before and then mm. now there there the question was and and so so we expected that it it you know f for everyone it it feels the same like like for us and uh, and this was um, this was uh, definitely uh, not the case so um, we would we would probably. Um, take a different approach next time um, we would make sure that we have more um, money to our dis uh, disposal to to uh, um, yes to to make um, publicity hmm. because if you know even if you think you have a smart campaign a smart question if you don't have the money to pay for the comp for a huge campaign your yeah, y your chances are low that you that you reach uh, everyone. But yeah, if I can add something, I mean, obviously I've been criticizing a bit, but I mean, I think the the initiative had really the merits to bring that debate to the forefront. So I think that's 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 been a, a, a good thing. But it's true that some people were even angry. They were like, you know, why are we asked to vote on that? And I mean, Swiss people are used to vote on a lot of weird issues, but they were really it just that's what I said from the beginning. It, it really came out of the blue. But what I'm completely convinced is that rather than the population. I think a lot of politicians and MPs have realized that there is an issue there. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I've heard of people who say, you know, oh, you know, I'm going to work on that subject. People who want to talk to me, uh, following my books and everything. So it's not that. Uh, and and, I, and I, I, as I said, I think it just, it just came out too much out of the blue yeah. with no prior dialogue, pr no prior discussion. And then, you know, as you said, people but politicians as well have a lot of things on their agenda and just things just go one after next and you couldn't really insert that subject and, and excellent we, we, we were a heterogeneous group and you know within our association people weren't 100% sure what is the best way because everyone was was no no one actually had experience with with uh, such a campaign or with the, with the people's initiative so we were a democratic association, and and sometimes we just voted. You know, we were twenty people in a room, and uh, and then we had to make really tough choices. For example, is it the right moment to launch this uh, initiative now? Yep. And then you decide, and then you go and try, and then you figure out, and learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is exactly makes sense as well because in 2014, 13, I organized a European campaign, European citizens' initiative in Europe for basic income. And this is somehow what brought me here. Like I was an ignorant in politics, and just by trying, doing this exercise, you kind of yeah. educate yourselves about the political prospects and, and and the political process. So, so thank you very much. I think that's a great conclusion. Like yes, it failed, but it's a process. Uh, it doesn't stop here. Uh, the issue is now on the agenda, and uh, yeah, we have more work to do. But for now, I propose to uh, have a drink mm -hmm. to uh, celebrate uh, the effort of the.